So, thank you, Adam. Welcome to our City Talk tonight. And I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of our land, and acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. And I'd like to particularly welcome Peter Frey uh, and Alan Jones and Tim Flannery and our panel members, David Holden, Robert Murray Leach, Peter Harkis and Neil Gordon. The City of Sydney spent nearly two years developing Sustainable Sydney 2030 through extensive consultations with city communities, with corporations and with other levels of government. We sought the expert advice locally and internationally and one of those people we sought advice from was Alan Jones, who reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 77.5% over 14 years in the borough of Woking in the UK and later, groundbreaking, did late, later did groundbreaking work in London. Remember, at that time, we invited him out from a city talk. And I think at the end of that talk, he got a standing ovation. He'll probably always remember it. Well, then we coaxed him to come and work with us. And tonight, and, and now he is our Chief Development Officer of Energy and Climate Change. And tonight, he's going to talk with Tim Flannery about how Sydney can achieve similar results and then join our panel discussion. During our 2030 consultations, the people of Sydney overwhelmingly called for us to deal with greenhouse gas emissions and global warming as a priority. Responding to that call is at the centre of our work now as we implement Sustainable City 2030. We've set ambitious targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 70% of 2006 levels by 2030, and equally ambitious targets for local energy, for energy efficiency, for water savings, for improved air quality, for reduced waste, and using waste as a resource and the use of renewable energy sources. We've made those commitments in the context that cities make up just 2% of the Earth's surface, they have over 50% of the world's population, and are responsible for a frightening 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. So clearly it's in our cities that we must achieve deep and and lasting emissions, and of course Sydney is determined to do its bit. The work that Alan Jones is leading for us will integrate our targets into a series of green infrastructure master plans, with the tri-generation master plan as the key link between them. This is the first plan of its kind in Australia, and I'm proud to say indeed the world, and it will enable us to retrofit our city with green technologies and infrastructure, delivered through the public and private sectors. It will ensure we can coordinate the infrastructure from wires and pipes to solar panels, water recovery and waste treatment facilities efficiently, cost-effectively and sustainably. Contracts are nearing completion for the decentralised energy master plans for tri-generation, for renewable energy and alternative waste treatment. Tenders for decentralised water master plans are currently being evaluated and an automated waste collection master plan will follow. Tri-generation provides us with the pathway for the decentralised water and automated waste collection systems, which can piggyback on the tri-generation infrastructure routes and stations so that we can deliver the green transformer concept that we set out in Sustainable Sydney 2030. The widespread implementation of tri-generation and other green infrastructure through what we call low carbon zones will deliver the City of Sydney, our greatest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. At present, 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the city come from the production of electricity at coal-fired power stations in the Hunter Valley. This is not only dirty and polluting, it's extremely wasteful, since two-thirds of the primary energy is emitted as heat into the atmosphere, using huge amounts of water to do so, and that in the driest continent on Earth. There are further losses in the long distance transmission over power lines to Sydney. Our goal is to produce 100% of Sydney's energy needs locally by 2030. 70% of this will come from our tri-generation systems with the remainder from renewable energy. Local tri-gen systems like these are almost three times more energy efficient than the present coal-fired plants because they capture the waste heat from the low carbon electricity generation and use it to heat and cool buildings with zero carbon thermal energy instead of high carbon grid electricity. We've identified the city owned properties that will be the hubs for our tri-generation network, our low carbon zones. And we've invited tenders from the private sector 
to design, build, operate and maintain the systems. The remainder of our reduction targets will be achieved through making our buildings more energy efficient, actively and through passive design, and by investing in renewable energy sources like solar panels we put on the roof of this building this year. So we consulted, we committed, and now we're into action. The tendering process for tri-generation has attracted interest from energy companies both in Australia and overseas. It's also attracting interest from the property trusts, which own almost 70% of our major commercial buildings in Sydney. And it should also appeal to residents because tri-generation not only saves on greenhouse gas emissions, but it'll also be cheaper for consumers in the long run. Over the next three years, electricity prices in New South Wales will rise by up to 42%. Most of this relates to the planned 18 billion upgrade of the, electri the electricity network, the network of cables, ugly power poles and substations just to shift dirty electrons from the Hunter Valley and elsewhere on a business as usual basis. Local tri-generation could make much of that work unnecessary and will remove the need for any new coal-fired power stations that would cost anything between three and four billion dollars. At present, the chief impediment to this logical path to a sustainable Sydney lies in government regulations which prevent the city from supplying building owners with local low carbon electricity. We can supply our own properties, such as this building, the Queen Victoria building opposite, and we can supply thermal heating and cooling to any building. But we can't supply our clean power to adjacent buildings owned by others, such as Energy Australia across the road, which we'd love to have as a customer. We've lobbied the New South Wales Government Ministers and opposition, members, minister, uh, opposition spokespeople to call for the removal, removal of these regulatory barriers. We've also made a submission to the Federal Government's Energy Efficiency Task Force, as well as a submission on electricity retail exemptions. However, we can't wait for government and we're out pressing ahead. We've asked participants in the tri-generation tender for their interest in participating with us in a Sydney Energy Services Company, or ESCO, to roll out tri-generation needed to reach our targets. Surplus electricity can be traded across Energy Australia's distribution network using the successful tender as elect electricity retail licence until we have removed, until we've had the re regulatory barriers removed. So to conclude, barriers to building a low carbon city remain, but we are being smarter and more strategic and importantly, our communities and business leaders are taking action themselves and looking to us for leadership. We'll hear tonight just how economic, large-scale tri-generation can be in meeting the needs of the most energy-intensive parts of our city, even with regulatory barriers in place still for decentralised energy. However, much more could be achieved if these regulatory barriers were removed as they were in the UK last year. This is an exciting time for us as we see new ways of living, working and powering our city take shape. So I hope you really get a lot out of tonight. Thank you.